We are continuing with the endocrine system hormones and the various glands. Uh, the thyroid gland is the next one we're going to talk about. It's kind of a butterfly shaped gland. It's on the interior neck, front of the neck, um, from the trachea. It is composed of what we call the ishmus, which is the middle portion, and then it connects the two lateral lobes. Within the lobes, you have various cells, such as the parafollicular cells that are producing the hormone calcitonin, and the colloid, which is the fluid that contains thyroid globulin plus iodine, the, the precursor to the thyroid hormones. So in this diagram, it is showing the relative location of the thyroid, as you can see, just below the larynx in front of the trachea, um, above the aorta, how it's, it's wedged in there. And you can also see how it is that classic butterfly shape to it. This picture is showing the uh, histology cross-section where you can see uh, the smooth open area. Um, it looks like that purplish color on this slide. That's the uh, colloid filled follicles. And then you can see the darker, smaller cells that are the parafollicular cells. Those are the ones that are secreting the calcitonin. And then the follicular cells are those that secrete the thyroid hormone itself. So the thyroid hormone is hugely involved with uh, helping control the metabolism within the body. It's found in two different forms, the T4 and the T3. T4 is also known as thyroxine, and T, uh, or T4 and T3 is the triiodine thyroid. Um, as you can see, they both uh, are involved with binding iodine. The T4 binds 4, the T3 binds 3 iodines. The T3 will be converted to the T4 at the tissue level. So the thyroid hormone is going to affect almost every cell in the body. So all, just about all cells are uh, target cells. They have receptors that will bind the thyroid hormone. Um, it's the hormone initially has to bind to the cell and then get inside and then will bind with the nucleus. It will help increase the metabolism or the metabolic rate that in turn is going to help increase heat production because any type of metabolic activity, one of the side effects of that would be is um, the release of heat. It helps to control or regulate growth and development. It helps to maintain blood pressure. And here is a diagram showing the regulation of it. Um, you have the hypothalamus that is going to stimulate the thyroid release hormone in the anterior pituitary. And it's another example of that cascade process that I've talked about previously where you don't have just one stimulus, that's it, and it turns a, or turns on the gland to release the hormone. You may have multiple steps where one hormone is going to stimulate the release of a second hormone, which is going to stimulate the release of a third hormone. So it's a stepwise process. Regulate and control um, at that point how little or how much of a hormone is going to be released and therefore affect different processes that are occurring within the body. This table is showing the major effects. As you can see, there are a lot of different effects on the various systems of the thyroid hormone. What the normal effect is, and then what happens when you are not secreting enough or if you are secreting too much. So hypersecretion is too much. Hyposecretion is not enough. Hyposecretion of the thyroid hormone in adults can lead to myxedemia, which the symptoms are going to be a low metabolic rate. Um, oftentimes you feel chilled, 
may feel kind of tired and more sluggish, just not as active as, as you normally uh, would. Because it tends to bind uh, iodine, if there's a lack of iodine, you may see what we call a goiter develop. It's this large, looks like a large growth. Um, what happens is you get caught with this lack of iodine, decreases the thyroid hormone levels. That in turn is going to, because the hormone levels are decreasing, triggers release of the thyroid stimulating hormone because it's low you need to stimulate to get more but you're not releasing enough and then that ends up having you uh, produce excess amounts of thyroid globulin that cannot be used and so the thyroid is enlarging containing all of this unusable thyroid globulin and you get this equator to try to help prevent um the equator when they realize that it develops due to a lack of iodine. Many, many, many years ago, they decided, well, we need to make sure that we are getting enough iodine in our diet. And one of the ways that uh, doctors decided to get iodine in our diet was, well, let's look at what foods are commonly consumed. Most people do put salt either as a preservative or as a flavoring in most of their foods. So that's why if you notice, uh, salt does contain iodine. High post-secretion in infants can lead to cretinism, which uh, can affect the uh, intellectual abilities, can affect proportional-wise the size of the body. And here is a picture of uh, some of the disorders, as you can see in this woman, the enlarged swelling in her neck, that is the goiter due to the enlarged thyroid. Hypersecretion, um, another thing, too much of a uh, thyroid hormone. One of the most common disorders is Gravis disease. It's an autoimmune disease. What happens is the body starts to make antibodies against those follicular cells of the thyroid. And bottom line, symptoms often have increased metabolic rate. They have increased sweating, irregular uh, fast heart rate, nervousness, weight loss. Even though you're eating a lot, um, you still have, because of this elevated metabolic rate, you still have weight loss. What is the treatment for that? Well, you can use radioactive iodine because iodine attaches to the hormone. It will destroy the cells, or you can just surgically remove the thyroid. This is uh, oftentimes a symptom associated with Gravis disease or these bulging eyes, and that's what the... Keep in mind, if somebody suffers from hyperthyroidism, too much of the thyroid hormone, and they end up doing surgery to remove the thyroid gland, now you're not going to be able to produce any thyroid hormone because you don't have a thyroid gland. So then at that point, you've gone from one extreme to the other. So after surgery, you will need to start taking thyroid supplements, and that's going to have to be adjusted on an individual basis to see what concentration works best for you for maintaining the proper levels of that. And, and initially, you're going to have to periodically have blood tests run to determine how the levels of the thyroid hormone are, the synthetic version that you're being given, because you don't want them too high, you don't want them too low. Calcitonin is produced by the parafollicular cells. Um, it is going to be released in response to high calcium levels. So it does the opposite of what the parathyroid hormone is going to do. Um, it tends to inhibit osteoclast activity, which makes sense. Because if you remember, osteoclasts are the cells that are breaking down the bone matrix. And what's in the bone matrix is calcium. So if calcium levels are too high in the blood, you're wanting to get those levels down. Don't add any more calcium from the bone matrix. 
So inhibit those osteoclasts. Don't let them break down that bone mass. Tell them stop. Enough is enough. It is also going to stimulate the calcium uptake into the bone matrix by the osteoblast. So it's like, don't release the calcium, put it back in the bone. And once again, this is showing those parafollicular cells that are secreted. Parathyroid gland, uh, depending on the individual, it can be anywhere between four and eight small little glands. They are on the posterior side of the thyroid. Uh, they do secrete the parathyroid hormone or the PTH. This plays a huge role with the calcium homeostasis. Calcitonin is released with high levels of calcium in the blood. PTH or parathyroid hormone is released in the reverse when calcium levels are in the blood are low. Um, so when calcium levels get really high, the PTH is going to be inhibited. It is going to uh, have an effect on target cells in the skeleton, the kidneys, as well as in the intestines. So if the calcium levels are low in the get it back up and so that's how it's going to work. Now in this picture before we move on it does show from a posterior view the uh, parathyroid glands I say they're on the posterior the back side of the thyroid gland. So what is going to happen with the parathyroid hormone? It is going to stimulate now the osteoclast Okay, now start breaking down that bone matrix because when you break it down, it will release the calcium, which is going to go into the blood, which now brings the levels back up. It will increase the reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys. Now, just keep in mind when we are talking about the kidneys, what happens is the blood is filtered there. First step in the kidneys is that as what we call filtration and most of the substances in the blood are going to be removed from the blood to start the formation of urine when we talk about reabsorption that's going to be the next step of where depending on what's going on in the body at that particular time you look at this new uh, substance that's ultimately going to form the urine and it has all the electrolytes in it and lots of water and now it's like okay what's going on right now what do we need to put back into the blood and that's what reabsorption is it's what's going from the precursor to the urine back into the blood so if the calcium levels in the blood are low then what's going to happen is the parathyroid hormone is going to stimulate target cells in the kidneys to say, do not have that calcium stay in the urine and have you pee it out. You want to keep it in the body. We're low. We need it back in the blood. So reabsorb it. It is also going to, the parathyroid hormone is also going to help uh, with the activation of vitamin D by the kidneys. And what is vitamin D? play a role in. It helps with the absorption of calcium in the intestines. Calcium is very difficult to absorb. You could have a diet very, very high in calcium. If you do not have enough vitamin D, you're not going to be able to absorb it. And so vitamin D is necessary for the absorption of calcium in the intestines. So the parathyroid Hormone is going to help with the activation. There's kind of a precursor to it. It starts with the skin, and then there's multi-steps. And finally, in the kidney, you have to activate that precursor so you actually get the vitamin D, so that then you can absorb in the, the intestines, absorb that calcium from whatever food or drink items you consumed. All of this is to increase the level of calcium blood. So this is a diagram that's showing uh, the effects of the parathyroid hormone, PTH, on 
the bone, on the kidneys, on the intestines. Once again, the stimulus is because there's low calcium concentration in the blood. You have to get it back up. One of the clinical manifestations, hyperparathyroidism, is uh, often due to a uh, tumor. And what happens now is you're secreting too much of the PTH hormone. And you can have several different effects. You're overstimulating the osteoclast, so you're pulling a lot of calcium out of the bones too much now. So what's going to happen to the, the bones? They're going to get softened because that matrix helps add a lot of the hardness to the bone and you're softening them up and there can be deformities there. If you have elevated calcium levels, that's going to have an effect on the nervous system. Remember, uh, the action potentials when you're talking about the nervous system and an action potential moving down the axon of the neuron and it reaches the axon terminus. One of the first things it does is going to open a calcium ion gates. So well, you've got a lot of calcium that's going to be coming in. It, it ends up depressing the nervous system. You can also have the formation of kidney stones. So side effects from having too much. Now, if you have too little parathyroidism, um, you can have just as serious other side effects from that. Tetany, you can have respiratory paralysis in it. So the, the levels of calcium must be very closely regulated, as most of your electrolyte levels are. <coughs> Remember, there's always a range that it um, needs to be in. You want to keep it within it. You do not want spikes. You don't want severe depressions. You'd like it to remain relatively steady. The adrenal gland, you have a pair of the kind of pyramid-shaped organs that are on top of the kidneys. Uh, technically, if you look at the structure and also if you look at the function, it's really two glands combined in one. You have the adrenal cortex, and that will secrete several different hormones. And then you have the adrenal medulla, which um, is usually classified as nervous tissue, and it's associated with the sympathetic. So if we look at the adrenal cortex first, <coughs> as I said, it has several different hormones that it does produce. Collectively, we refer to them as the corticosteroids. Um, the rate of the release kind of depends on the synthesis because it's not stored in the, the steroid hormones are not stored in the, the cells. There's three different layers of the cortical cells, and they are producing different types of corticosteroids. There's the mineral corticoids, the glucocorticoids, and the gonadocorticoids. And this is just showing the three different layers. The mineral corticoids, these are regulating the electrolyte concentrations, mostly sodium and potassium. Um, so it's going to be monitoring and regulating it in the extracellular fluid. ECF is extracellular fluid. Sodium is extremely important. It helps. The concentrations of it is going to have effects on the volume of the extracellular fluid. It's going to have an effect on the volume of blood, the blood pressure. It's also going to play roles with the levels or concentrations of other ions, such as the potassium, hydrogen ion, chlorine, etc. Potassium is very important, as you know, with uh, maintaining the resting potential of the cells. Aldosterone is one of the, the most potent of the mineral corticoids. It helps to stimulate sodium reabsorption by the kidneys. Once again, that's um, after filtration has occurred in the kidneys. The sodium has been re removed from the blood and it's in the urine. It's to reabsorb, put it back into the blood and aldosterone is going to help uh, stimulate that and control depending on circumstances at that particular moment as to how much needs to go back into the blood. Uh, as I just mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, sodium plays a huge role 
in blood pressure. It's also going to be involved with blood volume. Aldosterone is also going to help to stimulate the uh, release or elimination of potassium by the kidneys. So if there's too much potassium, let's get rid of it through the kidneys. Effects are going to be short-lived. Um, there are different factors that are regulating the aldosterone secretion, which will this uh, show some of the mechanisms that are controlling the release of the aldosterone. You could follow the flow charts. Hypersecretion, um, which aldosterosterism, is usually due to a tumor on the adrenal cortex. Um, what are some problems that can be associated with that? Hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and edema, which is excessive sodium then. And then excretion of potassium. And if you're excreting too much potassium because that is involved with the resting potential and maintaining the proper resting potential, then that means if you're excreting too much, you now can have abnormal uh, non-responsive neurons and muscles. Your glucocorticoids are influencing uh, metabolism amongst the cells. They help us to resist stressors. They help to maintain blood glucose levels at a fairly constant level. Once again, you don't want spikes. You don't want big dips. You want it relatively constant. They will also play a role with blood pressure. Some of the glucocorticoid hormones include cortisol, which is hydrocortisone, cortisone, and cortisterone. If you have hypersecretion too much, um, this is known as Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome, it tends to uh, have a decrease in blood and uh, bone formation, cartilage formation. It will depress the immune system. It tends to inhibit in the inflammatory response. will have uh, effects on both the nervous system, cardiovascular system, and your gastrointestinal system. <clears throat> Several potential causes the tumors. Uh, what are some of the signs? You get what's known as a moon face or a buffalo hump. The buffalo hump is, is a hump. Uh, looks kind of like a, a bulge between the shoulder blades. What is the treatment for it? Um, is removal of the tumor, discontinuation of drugs. Hyposecretion is what is known as Addison's disease. Um, you end up with a decrease in glucose and sodium levels. You usually get weight loss, severe dehydration, Hypotension is low blood pressure. And so what is the treatment going to be is replacement therapy. And so in this picture, it shows what are the effects of excess glucocorticoid. The patient in the, the picture on the left side before and the same patient on the right. And you can see that white arrow is pointing. You see that, that bump or that hump? That's the buffalo hump. The gonadocorticoids are the um, often called the adrenal sex hormones. They're weak androgens. Androgens are male sex uh, hormones that can be converted to testosterone. Some of them can be converted to estrogen. They may play a role in onset of puberty and the secondary sex characteristics appearing. Hypersecretion. It, there's not going to be any really true noticeable effect in adult males. Um, generally speaking, it's more of a masculinization. Females, you tend to see this masculinization, such as maybe more masculine patterns of body hair. Uh, in young boys, you may have the secondary sex characteristics um, appear earlier than what you might have expected, similar to what appears. Like. The adrenal medulla produces both epinephrine and norepinephrine. The effects of both of these are going to be vasoconstriction, increased heart rate, increased blood glucose levels, and the blood's going to be uh, diverted more to the brain, the heart, and the skeletal muscle. 
if this sounds very familiar, like uh, the sympathetic division of the nervous system and what happens in what's commonly referred to as fight or flight, then yes, you are correct at that time. Um, epinephrine is going to be more of a stimulator of the metabolic activities. Norepinephrine is more of an influence on your peripheral vasoconstriction and blood pressure. The responses are going to be very brief. Respond now, see the effect now, but it will not be long lasting. And so this is showing long term versus uh, short term stress effects on the, with the adrenal gland. Hyposecretion. Um, if you don't secrete enough, there's really no problem per se associated with it. Hypersecretion, where you're secreting too much, um, basically those symptoms that you're effects of the sympathetic nervous system, such as that increased metabolic rate, the fast heart rate, uh, kind of this nervousness and high blood pressure, etc. You tend to see those symptoms. Um, and that's a little bit tough on the body for long term. It could be due to a tumor. It could be due to other reasons as well. This table is showing a summary, once again, of your adrenal gland hormones, what the stimulus is, how they're inhibited, what the target cell is, what the effects or function of them are, and what happens when you secrete too much versus not enough. The pineal gland is found uh, in the brain. It is a very small uh, gland, hangs from the roof of the third ventricle. It does produce or secrete melatonin, which is a derivative from serotonin. And melatonin can have several different effects. Uh, the timing of sexual maturity at puberty. One of the big things is your day-night cycles. It can have effects on things like body temperature, sleep, uh, appetite, etc. Once again, this is a, a picture showing the location of the various endocrine uh, glands that we have talked about so far. The pancreas is located uh, kind of behind and underneath the stomach. It actually has both exocrine and endocrine cells. The exocrine glands are the acne cells. They are producing um, the pancreatic juice that's going to aid in digestion. It's going to be released into the small intestines. And then it contains the, what was known as the pancreatic islets or the islets of Lagerhans. Those are subdivided into alpha cells and beta cells. The alpha cells produce glucagon, and then the beta cells produce insulin. So those are the two hormones that are produced. And in this uh, histology slide, you can see the uh, different cells associated in the pancreas. The alpha cells are those smaller, typically they look kind of a reddish or a dark pink color, and then the beta tend to be paler and more purplish in color. <coughs> Once again, the beta cells produce insulin, the alpha cells produce glucagon. So what is glucagon? Well, it is going to be triggered or stimulated by decreased glucose levels in the blood. Um, it can also be triggered by sympathetic nervous system. So that you, the idea is glucose levels are low in the blood. You need to get it up. You need to raise those levels. So how are you going to do this? Well, the glucagon is going to target the liver. And why is that? Because you have, when you have excess glucose, animals do not make starch. Plants do. They will store excess glucose as starch. But as animals, we don't make starch. We make something that is similar to starch, and that it is the glucagen. Glucagen is essentially long chains of glucose. 
which is what starch is. The difference between starch and glycogen is starch is just long parallel chains of glucose. Glycogen are long chains of glucose as well, but they are branching. They have branches off of them. So you think of this long chain with all these multiple branches. And what is it made up of all these smaller components or like beads of glucose? And it's going to be stored in the liver. So glucagon is the hormone that is going to be released when glucose levels are low. It's going to target the liver where the glucagon is stored to break it down. It's like taking a long chain and just one by one breaking off those glucose molecules. And where's the glucose going to go? In the blood. So you're going to get the levels up because that's what you need right now. So glycogen lysis, break the word down. Glycogen lysis. Lysis is breaking or bursting, cutting. You're cutting up that glycogen into the smaller components, which are glucose. Glucagon is also going to help synthesize glucose, make glucose from lactic acid and other non-carbohydrates. You can take lactic acid and from there start adding carbons to it. Lactic acid has two carbons on it. Glucose has six. So one by one you start adding uh, carbons to it and eventually you make glucose. That is gluconeogenesis. Gluco stands for glucose. Neo is new. Genesis is forming. So you're forming new glucose molecules. And you're going to be releasing all this glucose into the blood. So glucagon is going to be stimulated when glucose levels in the blood are low. And get glucose back, levels back up in the blood. Insulin is going to be the reverse. It is secreted when the blood glucose levels are high. You need to now lower it, decrease the level of glucose. It's too high. Bring it down. And so that's what the insulin is going to do. How does insulin work? Well, number one, it does help enhance or increase the transport of glucose into fat and muscle cells. Because if the glucose goes into the cells, it's not in the blood anymore. It will inhibit that breakdown of glycogen to, to glucose. So the glucagon was breaking the glycogen down. Now insulin is going to inhibit that. We don't want you to break it down. Don't break that chain. It is also going to inhibit that conversion. It inhibits the gluconeogenesis, that conversion of, say, lactic acids and other fats and amino acids to build and make new glucose molecules. It inhibits that. And so this diagram is showing, yes, it's kind of like a teeter-totter. You want it to remain level and balance. That's what homeostasis is all about. You don't want it to get too high. You don't want it to get too low. But there are ways that the body has of regulating if it does start to get too high or too low. Ideally, you want the blood glucose level to be roughly around 90 milligrams per 100 mils. So if it gets too high, then the insulin is uh, released is stimulated once again in the pancreas, and it starts to break that glucose down and get it to store in excess uh, cells. If um, the glucose levels are too low, then take the glycogen, break that down, that's stored in the liver, to get, break it down to the glucose to get those glucose levels to rise back up. Diabetes mellitus. You'll notice there's two different types of diabetes. We previously talked about diabetes insipidus, which has to do with the antidiuretic hormone and basically uh, kidney uh, malfunction in you become dehydrated. Diabetes mellitus has to do with sugar levels. Um, there's different types. There's type 1 and type 2. This is what most people think of if you just say the word diabetes. Type 1 is hyposecretion of insulin. 
Type 2 is hypoactivity of insulin. So what happens is when the blood glucose levels remain high, the person can start to feel kind of nauseated. Um, that can lead to the sympathetic response, which is that fight or flight, which is further going to increase blood glucose levels. And so you end up with these high levels of glucose. It gets even higher. Excess glucose can um, eventually be released in you don't normally find it there, but um, that can be one sign of diabetes. There are three main signs. There can be several, but these are three main ones for uh, diabetes. Polyuria, which is a huge urine output. Glucose can act as a diuretic, and so that increases the amount of water into the urine, and so you tend to have very dilute. Uh, urine and having to uh, basically release a lot of urine. If you're releasing a lot of water from the urine, then that means that one of the body's responses to keep you from getting dehydrated is to trigger the thirst response. In other words, you're going to feel thirsty. That's the response to becoming dehydrated. Well, you've been essentially peeing a lot. You're losing a lot of water. And so the other thing that you have is polydipsia, which is excessive thirst. You're trying, your body's wanting to maintain that certain level of water, and it's having a tough time doing it. Cells are not able to take up the glucose. Why? Because with diabetes, you're having a problem with the insulin. Insulin is necessary for the cells to take up the glucose. So even though you may have a lot of glucose that you're intaking, it's not getting into the cells. The cells are essentially starving. So now what happens? Well, you can't get that sugar. Glucose is a sugar. You can't get it in to use it as a cell in the cells for normal metabolism. So then you start using fats. What happens then is you end up with a high level of fatty acids in blood as it starts to break down. The body can start to break down the uh, fats. You end up with fatty acids. This ends up, and you start to see here's a whole other kind of cascade thing. You can't use the sugar, so you're using the uh, fats. You're breaking that down. You're releasing fatty acids into the blood. Fatty acid metabolism now is going, you start breaking down those fatty acids. What do they break down to? Ketones. Ketones are acidic. So now what's going to happen? You're going to drop the pH in the blood. That leads to ketoacidosis. You can also end up having ketone bodies in the urine, which you shouldn't have there. What happens if you don't treat the ketoacidosis? Well, it can start having effects on uh, heart activity, oxygen transport, affect the nervous system. Eventually, it can lead to coma, and it can actually be fatal. Hyperinsulinism is where you're secreting excessive amounts of insulin because you're secreting all this excess insulin you end up having hypoglycemia. It's breaking down all the glucose in the blood, so the, the levels of glucose in the blood are dropping and dropping. What are the symptoms now? Now, typically, um, kind of becoming disoriented, uh, nervousness, anxiety can lead to unconsciousness, and this can also lead to death if left untreated. So what is the treatment for this? Ingest sugar. So this table is showing what some of the consequences or effects of an insulin uh, deficit, having diabetes. What, what is this going to do? One thing this does not show is the effects on all the different systems long term. And there are multiple, multiple effects that we see from diabetes, especially if left untreated. So it's very, very important that if you're diagnosed, that you follow the recommended guidelines and treatments to try to keep this under control.
with the gonads, the sex organs, and the placenta. They uh, can be producing sex hormones, <coughs> the same ones that are produced in the adrenal cortex. So the ovaries are producing estrogens and progesterone. Estrogen is involved with that maturation of the reproductive organs. It's also going to uh, help stimulate the secondary sexual characteristics. And along with progesterone, it uh, is going to be involved with the breast development. It's going to be involved with the cyclic uh, changes that occur. The testes are producing testosterone which once again, for the males are going to help to uh, initiate that maturing of the male reproductive organs and the appearance of the secondary sexual characteristics and sex drive in males. It's necessary for the normal sperm production. The placenta is going to be secreting uh, estrogen, progesterone, and what we call HCG, human chronic gonadotropin. That is the hormone that we for in pregnancy tests. Now, some other organs can also produce hormones. You've got uh, adipose tissue, fat tissue that can release things such as leptin, which is going to help with appetite control, uh, resistin, and aponaxin. Gastrointestinal tract is going to be producing different things like gastrin, which helps to stimulate the release of uh, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, secrete, which stimulates the liver and the pancreas. Um, and we will discuss in, in this case when we talk about the digestive system. The heart, you have atrial natriuretic peptide or AMP. This helps to decrease blood sodium concentration. So therefore, once again, sodium, think blood pressure, blood volume. The kidneys, erythropoietin, helps with the production of red blood cells, helps to stimulate that. And renin is going to be involved with initiate the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. In the skeleton, osteoblo osteoblasts are going to secrete osteocalcin. This is going to stimulate the pancreas to secrete more insulin, um, basically be involved with glucose handling. Um, and then the skin, we have some of the precursors for vitamin D that I've already discussed is necessary for calcium uptake uh, in the intestines. Uh, the starts in the, the skin, some of this is, uh, just so you know, the precursors are also one thing that helps to stimulate them is exposure to sunlight. So this is something just kind of FYI is a balance. Um, you need to have exposure to sunlight to stimulate the calcitriol and the chlorocalciferol, which are precursors for vitamin D, which you need to have for um, the absorption of calcium in the intestines. But you don't want to have too much sun exposure because we know that that can lead uh, to increased risk for skin cancer. So sometimes it, some people can kind of feel like it's a catch-22. Uh, okay, what do I do? I don't want skin cancer, but if I'm not the, the sun, I don't have that exposure to the UV light to start this whole process for the vitamin D, which I need for the calcium, for all the various comments we've already said, strong bones, proper neural functioning, etc. So that is something that each individual has to um, look at. Um, I can tell you just from my own personal experience, I have had several rounds with skin, skin cancer already. It does run in my family. I had my first bout with skin cancer when I was about uh, believe I was 27. And so, um, and I've had multiple rounds with it since. So personally for me, um, I'm also of a Celtic background, so I burn. Um, I have freckles, I'm at high risk for skin cancer as it is, and obviously I've already had it. 
So I'm at the point where my dermatologist finally recommended that, yes, I need to really limit my time in the sun, certainly wear sunblock, be careful when I'm out, because I know that I'm not out as much as I should um, to start this whole process of the precursor for vitamin D, etc. cetera, um, that has been recommended. So I, I do take a vitamin D supplement because the risk for me, like I said, I've already had skin cancer and the risk is just too high uh, for me to have excessive exposure to UV light to start the process of me making my own vitamin D. The thymus is the last of the endocrine glands we're going to look at. This one is a little bit different in terms that it's larger and uh, more active in infants and children. And then as you uh, age, it shrinks, it gets smaller and smaller. It's involved with the development of the T lymphocytes, which are involved with uh, immunity. It's, it's part of your immune response. So we're going to look at uh, in detail, quite a bit of detail, of what the T lymphocytes actually do uh, when we do study the immune system. But the thymus, I say it's, it's large in infants, and then as you age, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. 